everyone and welcome back to Learning with Yagman X. Today I'm going to be starting a new series with you where we explore the camera angles from some of our most beloved horror games, starting with none other than Resident Evil. I'll take you through step by step how to recreate the iconic liquor introduction from Resident Evil 2. In this video, we're going to cover fixed camera angles, tank controls, and triggering a animated sequence just as the camera switches. All the basics you need for a classic Resident Evil game. So let's jump on into the editor. I'm using Unreal Engine version 5.1 for this tutorial, however, it could also be relevant to Unreal Engine 4 or 5.23, whatever comes after this. I simply created a new project and used the third person template, so we already have all the third person assets we need for our fixed camera scene. When you open your project, you will be greeted with a level similar to this, but without all of these lovely white boxes everywhere. I have put these in because the first step to this is to white box out our level. White boxing means to literally use boxes and other placeholder items just to see how the look and feel of a level will be before putting in your final assets. And Unreal Engine is great at providing you with these quick and easy items to use, so you can just click on one I'll press Ctrl B and you can see they're all stored within architecture. So the architecture folder within starter content within the content folder. Just in case you are very new to Unreal Engine and you're not quite sure how to place things, you literally just click and drag into the level here. I'm gonna delete this out because I don't need it. If you click on something, it will automatically allow you to move it uh, and that you can also make this happen by pressing W on the keyboard. If you press E on the keyboard, you can rotate like so. If you press R on the keyboard, you can actually scale and Control Z brings it back to how it was before you changed it. If you have a bunch of stuff that's floating, uh, you don't have to manually put it on the floor. You can just hit the end key and it just goes automatically to the nearest uh, static mesh below it. Another handy tip, Hold down Alt as you move something and you will have duplicated it. I created this based off what I could see within the Resident Evil scene that we're going to recreate today. So this is gonna be the kind of starting back room. I'm not quite sure what room that is, but he's in this police room and then he goes around the corner and this is the iconic first liquor moment where he walks and then there's a liquor that scuttles across and then he goes into this little door here and uh, the camera changes to look at him from outside the window. Just to make sure everything is working as expected, I have my player start here. Make sure that you put this uh, where you want Leon to start. And if we hit the green play button, we can see our little iron Iron Lady, that's what Unreal Engine's character looks like. So yeah, walking around the scene, good, good, good. All looks good. Now we just want our fixed cameras in here and we want tank controls. Cause as you can see, the camera is very free at the moment and also so is the movement. We don't have tank controls. Press escape to get out of that. And I think the first thing we should do is actually dive right on in with some blueprints. So I have actually created a blueprint folder. To create folders, you can literally just right click and create folder somewhere there, new folder. Uh, I like to put all my blueprints in one folder because it helps me to keep things nice and clean. I'm just gonna delete this new folder. Uh, so I've got a tutorial blueprints folder and that's where I'm going to put all of the blueprints we're going to create today. So in wherever you want your blueprints to be, right click and we're going to create a new blueprint class. And this is going to be a class type of actor. And I'm just going to call this BP underscore so BP just stands for blueprint, so I know what it is. It's easier to search for this way as well. Uh, fixed 
camera. Yeah, there we go. And if I double click on this one, the blueprint should open for us. Right, let's pop this in here. So what we need is a blueprint that can handle not only camera switching, but also when the cameras should switch. So this should be based off a collision. So in the components, I'm going to add a cine camera. And I'm also going to add a box collider. So box collision here. Now there is a camera that you might have come across before. It's just a basic camera viewport. Uh, this is the one I do believe that comes automatically default uh, with the third person player. But I prefer to use cine cameras because we have more control over things like focus, um, aperture, film back. As you can see, you have all of these settings here so we could play with it and make it really cinematic if we wanted to. So for ease of use, I am going to make this box pretty big because it's going to probably cover quite a large surface area. So I'm just going to make it 500 by 500 by 500 as a good rule of thumb, we always want to change a collision box's box extent over its scale. And the cine camera is here. I'm just going to move this up a little bit because it's always going to be a little bit further up. Maybe 200 will do. Just to call out on Blueprints compiling, you compile to make sure that any of the the logic within your blueprint is uh, execution executionable. <laughs> That's a hard word to say. What I like to do is I click on the three dots next to it and I say save on compile only on success only. So this means that you won't have to be constantly resaving your blueprints all the time. It saves you a little bit of time. Also on the topic of working smarter, go into your class defaults up the top here and make sure that start with tick enabled is not true. This will save on some performance and uh, you'll thank yourself in the long run. What we're creating today won't need to be ran on tick. All right, that's the cleanup sorted. Now let's go into our box collision and in the box collisions details panel, you can see above me there, it has a bunch of settings. If we just roll down or scroll down, that's a bit better. Uh, until you find collision, you could also just type collision in the search bar here. And what you want to do is make sure that the character cannot step up on this. We don't want it to affect navigation for the character, so say no. And uh, leave it on over or overlap all dynamic. That should be fine. Okay, and now we're going to compile. Okay, that's that set up. So if we go into our event graph, it's just up the top of the viewport here. Uh, you can see that we already have a few events available to us. So we definitely don't want event tick, just hit delete on that one. We also don't want act to begin overlap because we're going to use the box collision for that. Uh, we will use begin play a bit later. We'll leave that alone for the time being. But if we click on the box component again on the left and then uh, look down to its events on the right and you should find on component begin overlap. So press the plus button here and a new uh, event will be open to you. So now we have been given a event that will trigger whenever anything overlaps our collision box. But what we want to make sure is that only the player will trigger the changing of the fixed camera angles. So in other actor on the event itself, just left click and drag and in the search box, just search for equal equal. So it's basically just like code syntax. And if you don't code, then welcome. This is basically coding. So uh, I hope you feel cool. So let's press enter and we're going to use this. So this will check to see, hey, is the other actor the same type of whatever object reference we're going to put here? And the object reference we are going to use is our player character. So we have just been overlapped. Is the other overlapping actor the same as player character? And then from the end point here, this is a Boolean, which just comes back with a false or a true and uh, we can use it to branch 
our logic here. So we're going to connect these up. So if it is a player character, we can carry on through and keep doing what we want to do and change that fixed camera angle. If not, we don't want it to do anything. Okay, so off this true is where we want to say, okay, switch the viewport. However, I'm going to do this in a separate function because later on, I'm going to show you how to make child blueprints of this blueprint. Don't get scared if you've never heard that time. It's not that scary. Let's create a function now. So on the left hand side, it says functions. If we click on the little plus button, we can create a new function and I'm going to name this uh, on fixed cam overlap. Okay. And here's where I want to put our logic. First of all, right click, because we need to get a reference to our player. Is it? It's not player camera. No, player controller. That is the one. And uh, click off this one. And we want to set a view target. Yes, with blend. Perfect. That's the one. So this is basically going to go, where's our player controller? What is the player controller's current viewport? Let's change it to be the new viewport target of whatever we put in to this little variable here. You'd think that we would just pull our cine camera and say, I want to use this one. But no, actually, uh, I'm just going to delete that one here. If you hover over it, it says it needs an actor object reference. And luckily enough, this blueprint itself is an actor object. As you can see at the top right, it's parent class's actor. So let's left click and drag off that. And we're literally just going to say ourself. We're just going to get a reference to this blueprint. And then it's going to say, OK, what is the viewport in this blueprint? Well, it's the cine camera. Blend time and all of this, we're not really going to worry about because in Resident Evil, it doesn't have any blends between the camera viewports changing. It just snaps from one to another. But just to give us the option, let's right click on this blend time here and promote it to a variable. And I'm gonna do the same with blend func. I guess that's function. And here on the left, you can see there's a drop down called variables and um, you can press the little I and that means that you will be able to change what these variables are. So this blend time here above my head says zero right now, but I could put like six of these into the level, six of this blueprint into the level and each one of them could have their own blend times. So one camera could take five seconds to go from the current camera view to that camera view, whereas another one could be instantaneous and have a blend time of zero. So the only thing left to do now is to go back into the event graph and from on component begin overlap of our box collision, make sure that we're calling that function we've just created. So if the player is the one that's collided with it, then we want to call on fixed cam overlap. Perfect. And compile. Okay, so let's go back into our level and I'm just going to shove two of the blueprint in here so I can just show you. I'm just left clicking, dragging and letting go. So one of these are in here and as you can see, we can already see the uh, view preview of the BP fixed camera from this blueprint. And if I hold alt and drag it, then I have just created a new version of that blueprint. And if I press E, I can rotate it to face the other way. The only downside of using everything in one blueprint is that it could be pretty easy to just click on the camera and not realize that you've clicked on the BP fixed camera actor as a whole. And then you go to move the camera and actually you're moving everything. You're moving the collision box and everything. What you need to do if you only want to move, say the camera and not the collision box is to go into the details of that blueprint and click on the cine camera component. And now I can move it freely. So I'm going to move it right back here. Something like that will do for now. 
And then I want to click on the box and the same thing. I want to move this independently of the camera. So I'm just going to move it over here a little bit. And as you can see, you've got the box extents. So as I, I'm just clicking and dragging it really, uh, it's updating the collision extents of that box. So make this overlap a little bit. And with this one here, I'm just going to move the whole thing back. And then I just want to move the camera back a little bit. And now let's see if it works. So we haven't locked into this camera yet, but I'll talk to you about why that is in a second. But the collision was somewhere around here. So we should be snapping to the other camera view. There we go. So we've just snapped to the other camera view. Perfect. Uh, but as you can see, <laughs> It's actually really hard to know, there we go, we snap back to the other, the other camera view now. It's really hard to know in what direction you will go because we haven't set up tank controls. And it's really confusing, I'm pressing back and she's going forward now. I'm pressing forward and she's going towards the camera. It's, um, it's kind of confusing, I don't know where she is, <laughs> what she's doing. So that worked, but you know, it would be much easier if we had tank controls. But first of all, let's fix uh, why she wasn't going straight into a fixed camera view when she went in, because as we could see, the player start is actually already being overlapped by the collision area. See the collision area is here and she's there. You can actually change perspective at the top left of the viewport uh, and go into top perspective. And uh, if you press F, because I've got my player start selected, it will focus on that. And you can see a little bit better. These are the lines of my collisions and I'm definitely within it. So why am I not spawning in and instantly being seen by my camera. Let's go back to perspective here and let's open up the blueprint. So from what I can surmise, the player character gets spawned in before this on component begin overlap has a chance to run. So it's actually missing the first instance of it being overlapped. So it's not the nicest workaround. And if you can think of a better one, let me know in the comments, I'm all ears. But I'm just gonna put a slight delay here to allow the player character to spawn in before we actually check in the overlap whether we should have this specific camera be the one that is active. Um, so here is the delay and then I'm gonna get our box uh, collision and I'm gonna say is overlapping actor. Yep, that's the one. And uh, look for our player character again. So it's kind of a duplicate of what we're doing here, but because that one's not being triggered on begin play, we're basically just doing a manual check after a delay of 0 0.5 seconds. So wait for 0 0.5 seconds. Wait, is the player in this collision? And if it is, and we can go from return value, then we branch again. If it is, then we just want to do this call of on fix cam overlap. We can also just create another one. Maybe it'll look a bit nicer. So this is, these are both going to the same place, even though it's calling it twice. It's going to the same function that we have created. So that should fix the beginning issue that we had. So let's go back to our map again, hit play, and then there you go. There was a slight delay of 0 0.5 seconds, but now she's here. And, uh, oh gosh, yeah, I really need to fix these tank controls. I can't even figure out where she's going. It's so confusing. I don't know, she's gone. <laughs> she's gone. Now it is time for the tank controls. So if we go into our settings, which is up the top right here, we want to look for world settings. So click on that one and it should open up a tab somewhere for you that says world settings on it. And uh, what we're looking for is our game mode. So here it says game mode override and you can see it's using BP third press and game mode. There's actually a little folder and you can browse to the asset in the content browser using this button. So I'm gonna left click on that one. And here we go. 
This is our third person game mode. The game mode basically defines all of the rules of your game, including what pawn class you would like to use. And a pawn is the player character and how it's set up to look, how it's set up to animate, and how it's set up to move. So this is what we need to change for tank controls. The BP third person game mode is what comes with the third person preset that we loaded with. So I don't really wanna change this just in case you want it to be available to you. So I'm gonna just duplicate this one. So right click, duplicate, and I'm gonna make this uh, tank controls game mode. Tank controls. Game mode, and uh, I'm gonna do the same for the BP third person character because if you do double click and open up this game mode, there's a lot going on, but all you really care about here is default pawn class. And you can see it's using BP third person character. And if you click on the little folder again and minimize this one, it's showing you that it's this one, the BP third person character. So right click on this one, duplicate again. And again, we're going to be using, uh, actually we'll just put an underscore here and say tank controls. So it's third person character, tank controls. Okay, so double click and open up tank control girl. <laughs> That's what we can call her now. This is how Unreal Engine has already set up the third person character for us. As you can see, it's got the camera input and this allows a player to change where the character is looking based on their mouse movement. So we actually just want to unhook that because we want the camera to be stationary at all times, please. And here is movement input. So this is what we want to change. As you can see, they've got left and right movement input and they've also got forward and backward. For tank controls, what makes them really useful for fixed camera angles is that forward will always stay consistently forward, backwards consistently backwards, and left and right really just rotate the player. So if you press left, you're not going to move left, you're just going to look left. And then you can press forwards and again, the momentum will always be forwards. So this is what we are going to change here. So I'm gonna just change this comment so I know what it is. And I'm just gonna put tank in it. So I'm just changing it by double clicking on it. And we don't want to add any movement input on left or right. We just want it to affect the rotation. So I'm gonna completely remove that. And if we get a reference to our player controller, that player controller yeah here then what we want it to do is change the rotation ah that's the one we want it to set control rotation here so as you can see we need a rotator and none of these outputs here are going to give us one so we have to create a new rotator. So if you just write here, rotator, scroll right down and make rotator. And then it will allow us to create our own one. We can delete the get right vector. And what we want to do is plus, not plus, plus add the action value x to the return value z your of the control rotation and this will be our Z on the rotator that we've just created. I don't need this little node here, so I'm just gonna delete it to make it a little bit cleaner. And then we're going to get the control rotation and hook that up to X and Y. So basically all we care about is the player putting the action value of left and right, which is X, are they plusing it or minusing it? So are they going left or are they going right? And that now is just going to change the rotation of the Z of the player controller instead of actually making them move anywhere. It's just gonna change the rotation. So um, let's hook this one back up now. And we definitely want forward and backward to be still hooked up. We didn't change anything to do with forward and backward. That one can stay as is. And the last thing that we want to do for our tank controls to work is to go into the class settings at the top here. And in the details, we just wanna search for your, 
Um, nope. Make sure that the BP third person character is actually uh, selected in the components first. And you're looking for, yes, pawn. Use controller rotation your. We want to enable that. And uh, that should enable the tank controls to work. Okay, and then back into our map here, we can just go into the tank controls game mode that we made. And in the default pawn class, we can change that to BP third person character tank controls. I've got two because I did make this earlier, but it will work, trust me. Now compile. And the last thing we need to do now is go back into our world settings and make sure that the game mode override is using the new game mode that we just set up. So just search for tank and there you go, BP tank controls game mode. And now when we press play, she should be exhibiting tank controls. I'm pressing D right now and she's not moving anywhere. I'm pressing A and she's not moving anywhere. And then forwards will always be forwards. Ah, oh, W is always forwards, no matter where she's looking. Brilliant. Cool. Now we just really need to sort out these cameras because they are bad. <laughs> so let's sort these out. Okay, so I'm just gonna use my reference of the Resident Evil scene that we're recreating to make sure that all the cameras kind of line up where I want them to be. So bear with me. I'll probably speed this one up. Just don't forget that if you want to change your camera, you need to actually click on it in the details panel, click on your camera and update that one. While I was setting these cameras up, I just realized they're very zoomed in and I think I want my cameras to not be digital film. So this is one good reason why I created the blueprint. I can literally just go into BP fixed camera, go into my cine camera and change the default film back to be um, DSLR. So let's use that, compile that one. And now all of my cameras in my scene, no matter how many I've got, will now be updated to use DSLR. And there you go, yeah. That's a lot less zoomed in. I much prefer that. So you can kind of play around with these cine camera settings and see which ones you like. Um, while I'm in here as well, actually, I might just turn off the focus settings. Um, and we can do autofocus in the next video of this tutorial series, I think. But anyway, back to me setting up my cameras. One thing to note as well, if you want a smoother movement snapping on the cameras, you can press uh, this one here, the little grid at the top right of the viewport. Right now mine's on 10, and if I wanted to make it even smoother, my movement snapping, I can make it five, uh, so that's movement here. But if I want my rotation snapping to be smoother, I can make that five as well, so the rotation one's right next to it. And you can also just turn it on and off if uh, you want no snapping at all. But uh, yeah, something like that I should do, I think. And as you can see from the top-down perspective, I've got all my collisions lined up where I would like them to trigger the next camera. This collision actually needs to be way bigger. Yeah. Trying to make sure that they are lined up. It doesn't so much matter if they overlap too much because we don't really care about what happens when the player exits the collision. It's just what happens when they enters another one. Something that could really help actually um, to see where these collision boxes are, because I do understand they're pretty tiny. <laughs> so we could go back into BP Fix Camera, click on our box collision in the components, and we could actually up the line thickness to something like 10. And that should make them um, uh, much more noticeable here. So you know where they are. One thing I'd also like to say while we're here, you can pin the preview of whatever camera you have selected. So it will always stay on your viewport. So I'm just gonna pin this one now. And I notice in my reference that there is like a little, a little cylinder thing in this room. So I'm going to just switch me over for a second. Um, I have gone onto my shapes, which is in place actors, 
and you can see I've got like cubes, spheres, cylinders, I was going to call that a scone then, <laughs> cones and planes. I'm going to use a cylinder actually here because that's the right shape for what I can see uh, in my Resident Evil reference. I'm just going to scale it up a little bit and I could actually scale it uh, so it's a little bit taller. And that's what I am seeing in my reference. So this is exactly what white boxing is really good for. It's, it's knowing, okay, how does the space look with all of the elements, like a, a bookshelf or whatever this is. I don't even know what the, what is this in the Resident Evil? I don't know. How are they going to affect your environment without having to actually make the assets first and place them? You can just kind of figure out the scale and um, maybe it obscures something. I don't know. It's there for a reason and you want it to be replaced with something in the future. White boxing is good for that. Okay, so let's press play and uh, I'll show you what I've got so far. There she is. Oh, we can unpin this now as well. Um, okay, so she's here with her little tank controls. She's walking around and I can see that in my reference footage as well, Leon's head does get kind of cut, cut off by this thing that's here. So that's uh, pretty decent. And then there's a collision here, so it should switch. Yep, switching over here when she gets to this area and then she starts to walk towards the camera and this is when the dramatic liquor animation will happen and we'll do that in a second and this is the very cool I love these out the window shots that old fixed camera games used to do so um, yeah that's there if we go back have we lost her? No, she's there. If we go back, they will flip back to the old camera views. And yeah, we've, we've made quite a lot of stuff there where we could have some good fun with that. But I think what we need to do is um, trigger off that all important animation only when the camera changes. So at the very moment the camera changes, the animation of the liquor comes and it won't happen again. So it's a one time only thing. Let's quickly do that now. So you might have noticed there were some little blue boxes out here. These actually are just boxes that come with the default level that loads up, but you can use any boxes. I'm just gonna use these, but you could literally just use a cube from your place actors here if you wanted to. And I'm just gonna use uh, one of these and this is gonna be our spooky, spooky liquor. Oh gosh, how terrifying. And the way that we're going to animate it is by using a level sequence. So if we go into our cinematics in place actors, you will see something called a level sequence actor. So if you could please left click, drag and drop that into your scene for me, I would be a very happy girly. And uh, I'm just gonna right click it in my outliner as well and rename it so everything's nice and clean for me. Where's the rename button? As in edit, rename. Okay, so this is going to be liquor anim and let's just say LS, level sequence, liquor anim, cool. And actually I'm also going to right click and move to cinematic because I've got everything in folders here. So we've got a level sequence actor and as you can see in its uh, details tab, which my head is now over again, so one second. <laughs> it does need a reference to a level sequence asset. This level sequence actor that we've called LS Liquor Anim is going to play whatever level sequence asset we put in here. So right now it says none and if you click on the drop down, even if you have never made one ever, I have made one in the past when I was preparing for this tutorial, um, but you can still click create new level sequence up here. So that's what we want to do. Create new level sequence. And again, it's up to you where you put it. I like to put all mine in a folder called cinematics so you can right click new folder. So I've already got my cinematics folder and uh, I'm going to create liquor anim sequence. There. This bar was grayed out before the open level sequence but now it is not and we can click on it and it is going to open the sequence for our liquor anim sequence. It will be empty, there's gonna be nothing there, but there is a little tab down here for the sequencer. Click on the box or whatever you're using to represent your liquor, and then click on the plus track button within the sequencer tab, 
and actor to sequencer. Up the very top, it says add, and it will be whatever you have selected. So make sure you only have whatever you want to be the liquor selected. So I've add, added that in now. And all I really want to do is show this going from the bottom right of the window to the bottom left. So it'll be like it's crawling up there. Obviously, this is very placeholder. In the game, you would have it um, play an actual animation. It would be an actual rigged character. But I think this is good enough to show you how to do it. We want it to save the location. And one thing that's really handy is to make sure that you have this create a key when channels properties change uh, enabled. So this will just automatically create keys whenever I move it now. So say if I moved it to frame 50 and now I move it to the top left of my window, then it's already tracked the location. If for some reason that doesn't work though, don't worry. You can just click on the little add new key button here. And that again will track anything uh, that the cube or whatever actor you're tracking is doing at that time with their location. So to preview this, you can literally scrub through. So I can see I'm going left, right. Ooh, ooh la la, so spooky. <laughs> and um, you can also press uh, the play button. I'm gonna save it actually. Make sure you're saving. Press the little save button. So down the very bottom, there's little track options and uh, you can press play here. Now one thing you'll notice is that went on for a long time. That's because my level sequence is set to be 150 frames. Really, we just need it to be really quick. Because all I want it to do is go from, from here to there. So how do we activate this level sequence as soon as the camera switches? Good question. I mentioned before that we were going to be making a child blueprint of our fixed camera blueprint, and we're gonna do that now. So go back to our BP fixed camera. You can just click on BP fixed camera in the world outliner and then control B if you have lost yours. And uh, right click on it and create child blueprint class. So as it says here, this creates a child blueprint class based on the current blueprint, allowing you to create variants easily. It's right up the very top here. I'm kind of covering it a little bit, but I think you can still see it. So click on that one. And here we have BP fixed camera child, but I'm going to rename this to be called sequencer. BP fixed camera sequencer. So double click to open this one. Now, what you have in a child blueprint is everything that it shares with its parent. So it already has the box collision. It already has the cine camera. Anything you change in the parent will also be changed in the child. So it's really good to work this way if you know that you want um, a blueprint that shares a lot of the same functionality as another blueprint, but you just want to add something very particular to it, which is exactly what we're doing here. We want the fixed camera angle to change, but at the same time, we need it to trigger a sequencer. So we still want to use the same blueprint, we just want to add stuff to it. And that's where a child blueprint becomes very handy. So let's go into our event graph. As you can see, it's already going to play our parents begin play, uh, which is handy dandy. We can delete these two because we don't need them. And what we want to do is find our parent function that we created earlier called fixed cam overlap. That's it, event on fixed cam overlap. And uh, this will get triggered whenever our parent blueprint has triggered their function. So on fixed cam overlap, we want to right click and add a call to the parent function to make sure that it's still going to do the logic that we set up in the parent. So it's still going to switch to our cine camera here. But now we want to add some extra functionality to trigger a sequencer. So before we put any logic in, we need to make sure we have available to us a sequencer in the first place. So let's add some variables. We want to add a sequencer to play. And 
sequence, let's make this a type of level sequence actor. Okay. And again, we want to click the little eye so that it can be editable. I'll also just add some little booleans here. So I want to ask, should the sequencer just play once? So a boolean again is just a false or a true. And we want to make that public as well. Should it loop? Because we could have instances where we want the sequence to loop. Uh, and if it should loop, then how, how often should it loop? So loop amount, maybe you want to have full control over this and that'll be an integer. So an integer is just a rounded number. You can't have any decimals in an integer. And I will also do one more Boolean, which is has the sequencer played? Because if we only want it to play once, we need to know when it has already played. So those are all publicly editable, so we can change those on per instance of this blueprint being in a level. First things first, let's get the reference to our sequencer. I'm going to right click here and just look for convert to validated get. Now this just creates a get function that just looks for is this sequencer valid? If it is valid, carry on. If it's not valid, then let's just put a print string and say no sequencer found. So a print string is really good for debug. Uh, let's put it on for like 10 seconds. It's really good to put some print strings in if you're ever trying to debug why something's not working or in a case like this, perhaps it'll be very easy to accidentally forget to, to hook up the sequencer to this blueprint. So it, you'll always know, oh, something in here isn't working because it doesn't have a reference to the sequencer. If it is valid, then we want to check for whether it should be played once and also whether the sequencer has played at all. Um, if the sequencer has played, as you can see, the default value of a Boolean is always false. You can see that in the details panel here on the right, but you can change the default value. You can say yes, that it has already played, but you don't want to do that for this. <laughs> don't do that for this. Oh, and for that point, actually, I'm going to make sure that this is not instance editable because there's no reason for us to ever want to say whether a sequencer has played. It's purely for gameplay purposes. So this has a closed eye, whereas all of our other variables we've set up have open eyes. I'm going to do a check on both of these. So what this will be checking for is, is the sequencer play once? Yes. And has the sequencer played? Yes. In that case, then we could put a branch here. And if it's true, then we could say another print string. Sequencer has played once, so will no longer play. Well, we say played once and is set to only play once. So will no longer play. And I can change the color of this to like red. And again, I'll give it like a duration of 10 seconds, so we won't miss it on the screen. Uh, and this, this is a good check to do because we want it to only play once. So if play once returns false, uh, but the sequencer has played is true, then it will still return false because one of them is false. Okay, so let's get this one out of the way. Now we can check for the loop. So. Should this sequencer loop get and branch on that? If, if yes, it should loop, then we could say, well, we need to get a reference to our sequencer. So let's drag that one in here and we should say play looped looping. Here we go. So that's automatically got us a reference to the level sequence player object. So yes, it should be looping. Then let's play looping and number of loops. So as you can see, default is minus one. So actually I'm going to put on my loop amount, the default to be minus one. 
What this means is that minus one loops means infinite. It will loop infinitely. It will never stop looping. If you put a loop amount of zero, then it won't loop. <laughs> its number of loops will be zero. Um, one will mean it loops once, two, twice. You get the picture. So yeah, I'm keeping this default amount to minus one, but if we want to change it because it is publicly editable, then we can. And we're just hooking these ones up here. And if we don't want it to loop, then we could just play as it is. We don't need to use the play looping. You can just use play. There's an even simpler load for that. So if you go back to our map now, we need to find the fixed camera blueprint that will need to trigger the sequencer. And we need to change this to use the new child actor we've just created. If I select the child blueprint in the content browser here, right clicking on the one in the outliner, the one I want to replace, I'm choosing replace selected actors with and I've already have my BP Vix camera sequencer selected in the content browser. So I'm going to click on that one. And it doesn't reset the camera or anything because they are a child blueprint. So it doesn't look like anything has changed, but it has. If I just take this one out for you, you can see the type here says edit BP fixed camera sequencer. So we have just replaced it with our new child actor. Magic. I'm going to rename it just so I know what it is. Rename, please. Sequencer. Okay. And now let's give this a crack. Oh, wait, hold on. Let's have a look at the details of this one. So I didn't show you the details of the other blueprints that we made. So we can look in the default section of the details tab of our BP fixed camera sequencer. And you can see here it's got sequencer to play. Aha, uh -huh. see it wouldn't have worked because I haven't set that up yet. And I've got play once, should loop, loop amount, all of this stuff. And the blend time and the blend funk that we set up uh, from our parents. So the blend time is zero. That's why our cameras are snapping nicely. We don't want to loop them out. So this is good. It shouldn't loop. So this is good, but we do want it to only play one time. So I'm going to put this to true. And then I also need to set the sequencer to play. So I can actually just click on none and I can say liquor anim, uh, but there's also this little um, picker tool and I can click on that one. And if you can find your level sequence in your uh, scene, you can click on that one and just pick that there. But I've already got mine set up, so there we go. That should be everything set up uh, to go. So I'm just gonna save my map and then press play. And here we go. So she's going, she's going. She's uh, gonna go down this little corridor. Oh my God, so spooky. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> I love it. And now if I go back, <gasps> why is it doing that? Ooh, okay. So do once it's not working because it's doing multiple times. <gasps> I know what we forgot. I say we, I mean me, you didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I am the teacher here. Um, so if we go back into our fixed camera sequence, we did not, let me know in the comments if you already realized that I didn't do this. We didn't set has sequencer played. We need to say that the sequencer has been played. So we're gonna set this to be true, compile. So it's gonna go through here. And if it gets to play either looping or play just once, it will say, okay, yeah, we've played it now. Uh, and then back here in this check of play once, it can also update this one. So what was happening then was play once was true, but has sequencer played was never true. It was always false. So it was always coming through here. So if we try one more time, then spooky scary. Let's just go there and then back down again. There you go, sequencer has played once and is set to only play once, so we'll no longer play. 
And that's it. I really hope you find that useful. I guess one thing I could show you that I haven't shown you yet is the little blend. So on BP Fix Camera 2, I'll just quickly show you in the details panel. In default, I'm gonna set its blend time to like two seconds and you'll see what blending looks like. Uh, but for Resident Evil camera styles, you won't really need this. See, so it's slowly blending over. The only thing is you don't have control over that blend right now. I can show you how to in future videos. So let me know if you want to, um, but yeah, for Resident Evil, you really just want the blend to be at its default for zero and you will get nice clean snapping. And there you have it. Now you have recreated one of the most iconic moments in horror gaming history. I hope I've also shared with you some values of how you could create blueprints, you know, the difference between a parent and a child, creating variables that you can change publicly in the level. Hopefully there's enough in there for you to kind of go away now and play with them yourself. If you're a game dev, let me know if you would have set this up a little bit differently in the comments down below. And let me know if you know a workaround for making the correct camera play on Begin Play because yeah, couldn't figure that one out with my little noggin, but I'm sure us as a community, we can come up with something a little bit better than adding a delay there. We only touched on level sequences in this video, but if you want to learn more about how to utilize Unreal Engine's cinematic tools, and in particular, the sequencer, you can check out my other video all about how to trigger gameplay via the sequencer. And if you enjoyed this video, I would love for you to leave a like. It just lets me know that these videos are well received and that you want to see more of them because I would love to turn this into a series. I'd love my next one to focus on Silent Hill. Much more where this came from. Just so you know, I have moved all of my gameplay footage over to my second channel, Gaming with Yagman X. So please check that out if you're missing me playing games like oh, Resident chicken. Evil. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Oh damn. And also, I'm live on Twitch every single week, so I would love to see you in the chat. We do Monday morning motivation streams where we set out weekly goals, and I also just play games. So links are in the description down below. And as always, a massive thank you to my Patreons who got to see this video before any of you peasants on YouTube. Sorry, you're not peasants. As soon as I said that, I was like, that's so mean. Don't say that. They get to see early access videos. Uh, there's a pen pal tier where I send handmade cards to you. You get MP3 versions of the songs that I create and, and more goodies. Go check that out if you're interested and just thank you to everyone who is. I really, really appreciate all of your support. As always, it's a pleasure to share what I know with you and to learn from you in the comments. I'm sure I will. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely day or evening. And uh, yeah, I, I guess that's that. You still here? Oh, my light just changed color. I don't know why it did that. Okay, I think, I think that's good. I think we're good. I think we're good. This new format is very new for me. I hope you like it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>